and I'm the co-founder with my cohort in crime, Susie Westfall, of City Theater. Uh, we started the company uh, 16 years ago. Susie's a, a wonderful, wonderful playwright and our literary director, and, uh, and we hatched this idea to do new work. I was an actor, Susie's a playwright. Uh, we had a, a third compadre, Elena Wool, who was a, a, an actor and director, and then subsequently Gail Garrison. And uh, I've been with City Theater for 16 years. We've produced over 350 plays. I hope, um, for those of you who haven't seen Summer Shorts, I hope you will join us this evening to see the festival. Um, for all of you who are playwrights, I hope you brought us a short play, or else we have to lock the doors, and I'll let you out. But uh, we produce Summer Shorts, um, and I'm very, very proud that we're launching the City Rights Program, and, and really applaud Susie and, and Andy and Elizabeth in putting that together. And Hi, I'm Jeff Revels. I'm the artistic director of Orlando Repertory Theater. Orlando Rep is has been around since 2000, but really since 1926, we're just the seventh version of the same company. Um, so we are professional theater for family and young audiences. So our three stage complex is completely for family audiences, and we are in partnership with the University of Central Florida, who has an MFA in theater for young audiences and those students are housed in our theater. I'm Ricky J. Martinez, the Artistic Director of New Theater here in Four Gables, Miami, Florida. And we have uh, an intimate space of 100 seats and we pretty much balance the classics and the new works. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm Deborah Sherman. I am the Producing Artistic Director and Co-Founder of the Prometheum Theater. Uh, we are the professional theater in residence at Nova Southeastern University in Broward, which is the seventh largest private university in the United States. Um, we have been around, like I said, for seven years, and we uh, have a playwright in residence in addition to um, developing new work that we do about every year and a half. We do a world premiere of a new play uh, over the last seven years. So we've got two plays that are currently in the works, one is finished and one is being finished, and um, is actually being taken to um, the uh, actor studio in New York in October as part of the Directors and Playwrights Initiative to be workshopped there before we do the world premiere of it the following fall. Uh, so we're very, very committed to new work and to uh, producing new work and to getting behind uh, plays that have never been produced. Or in addition to doing um, musicals that involve dancing zombies and uh, cannibalism, and uh, we just closed Richard Greenberg's Three Days of Rain. So we vary very much what we do uh, to keep it very diverse. Uh, I'm John Manzelli. I'm the City Theater's Artistic Director. Um, before that, I was a founding member of the Naked Stage Company here in Miami. It's a small, sort of edgy theater. Thank you, Avi, for wearing the shirt. I appreciate it. Um, I feel very proud. Um, okay, so everyone on this panel has a connection to Newark. Um, either that's one of the things that they produce, well, actually, that is one of the things that they produce. That is their connection to it. Um, what, if anyone has something to jump into, is they really want a free flowing discussion, is there anything that really, like, excites you about a play that makes what what sort of brings something to your attention? How do plays come to you? How do you choose your seasons, I suppose? We'll start with that broad question, which I realize how broad it is. <laughs> okay. um, I used to be a, a reader before I was with City Theater uh, for a producer in New York, Manny Azenberg, and um, we used to read a lot of plays and he would tear off the front page of the plays. Now granted, a lot of these plays were plays that he was subsequently going to produce. He was tried um, to shows out in, in Durham and was an adjunct at Yale. And I just remember the one thing he said when you read a play, um, it's your immediate visceral response. And that always stuck with me. Um, your immediate visceral response is, do you like the play? Yes, no, why or why not? And, um, and that has probably been the thing that stuck with me, and I'm sure Susie can speak to that uh, far more than I can, uh, reading 1,200 plays a year for City Theater. But in our case, it's our immediate visceral response. Do you like the play? Yes, no, why or why not? And then from there, you move on to a whole myriad of, we all have our own parameters of what defines our season. For us, we're looking for the short play format. And then from there, you move with a, a stack of plays. I like to say, um, the plays pick the actors, the actors pick the plays. And um, it's a little bit like a Rubik's cube. Um, we try to 
have uh, a wealth of material, a diversity, um, and then we really look for our actors. We look to find uh, plays that we maybe have not gone to before, different um, thematic or um, stylistic uh, plays uh, in terms of putting up our festival. But I think at the end of the day, you want to fall in love. You want to laugh, you want to cry, and you want to have a visceral, God, I love this piece. So I think that us. Uh, Stephanie hit on something that When I was running Wasser Stage Company all those years, I, I think my primary response to a play was I wish if, if it was a play, I read and thought, oh, I wish I wrote that. <laughs> well, that's a way of saying I had a visceral response to it. So it's very personal if what an artistic director likes or doesn't like. Mm -hmm. So you can you know, look at their childhoods and figure out whether they're going to have But there's also, she, she mentioned uh, every theater has their regional theater certainly has their stars, their local stars. Uh, Louisville Actors Theater in Louisville, very definitely for years that Susan Kingsley, a whole mm -hmm. uh, stable of, of uh, local actors, or the New York-based actors that uh, somehow had a connection to that theater. So you, you say you get down to, uh, in Gloucester stage, the, the guy I broke in who took over his artistic career was very, very definitely uh, makes his final decisions in terms of the, the local stars for us. Uh, some of whom were Boston-based actors, went to New York, made careers for themselves, but like to come back to uh, Massachusetts for a working holiday. So that if you have a, a short list, uh, even a long short list of say 15 plays from which you're gonna pick five, usually the final decision is how well can I cast this play? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the guy who's running Gloucester Stage now sort of always looks for a play for, for Lindsay Krauss, who has a summer house up there. That's uh, kind of money in the bank for the theater. Um, so uh, turning that into rec to recommendation for uh, emerging playwrights, uh, look at the plays that of characters, you know, who uh, people those plays and see if your play is a match. And that's a, you know, if the theater obviously uh, uses the same actors over and over, you need to approach that theater say, I've written a play and I think it's a good play for so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so who, who are popular actors with their company. They definitely be a large foot in the door. I read them as an actor because that's where I started. I mean, I went I'm still an actor in addition to being a producer, so when I read a play, one of the things that the first read is I read it very selfishly as an actor, who I want to be in this play, which means if I want to be in this play, that means I can actually produce this play because I can find people that would also want to be in this play. Um, and I, you know, we at Promethean tend to find very character-driven plays, um, stories that are based on the people and what's happening at that exact moment before the, you know, the lights go up. Um, but when I look at them, I look at them and say, do I want to be in this? Is this something that I can, you know, we don't have a whole lot of money, but I can offer you a, a really beautiful carrot and this amazing part that you may not get, a, get to do otherwise, um, and here it is. And that's how we've been so fortunate to have some of the amazing folks that we've had on our stage do the work that they've done because, no, it's not a lot of money, but man, they don't want to miss that role. So then I go back and go, okay, yeah, can we actually build this cabin? Is this something that we can financially uh, afford? So, but when I, did, when I do the first read, and I know within the first 30 pages whether or not it, I'm going to finish reading it. So if I can't get through the first 30 pages, it goes to the, to the sad, sad, very tall pile in the corner. I'd like to add that another way for plays uh, to be developed and produced is to develop and produce and commit to a young playwright as opposed to specific plays. I've been developing and producing and directing new plays for about 25 years, and along the way, I try to get to know as many emerging
interesting young writers who are not being produced. I, I find it interesting that a lot of times when organizations grant grants to writers, they're writers who, in my opinion, don't need it. They're established already. Uh, what we need to do is find the playwrights, commit to them, the young playwrights, commit to them, and start producing their work. People, I mean, along the lines, I've worked with people like Adam Sinkowitz, who now gets produced and, and published all the time, and Lucy Gerber, and people like that. You start, you know, it's a committing to a playwright, to a bunch of different playwrights, so that it isn't about shopping for a particular random play, which is one way to do it, and a great way to do it. Um, but there's also, you know, there's also committing and fomenting the work of young people or not so young, playwrights, but people who need produce. Right, well, one of the things that we've done, we have a playwright in residence, and we have produced um, four, uh, he had no plays produced before we produced his first play, and then we pr we produced uh, one, two, three, four of his plays, and through the production of his new work, now that work is being produced at another theater, because we have this relationship with this playwright, exactly what you're talking about, that no one else was going to give him an opportunity. He got an opportunity to put on a play, to put up a show, to see how it worked, and then to become exposed. And through that, he's got this, this project, this workshop in New York coming up. And then Ricky has, um, he's commissioned him. has also, him. now a new theater has commissioned him. And he's our playwright in residence. It doesn't mean we own his life. It means that, you know, obviously he's written plays for us, but now Ricky's gone and commissioned him because of the progression of his work and the growth of his work and the fact that he has has established himself over the years and you can see the development and growth that has happened through the process with us. So now he gets to go to the next place and have another process and have another experience and have another, you know, um, I mean, you can speak to the I mean, I Definitely, the piece, is, the piece is, is uh, I think that allows the playwright to write with certain pieces for certain theaters, mm -hmm. with certain um, uh, objectives, uh, uh, visions. Every theater has its own kind of vision, and so for us, he's writing maybe something a little bit, a, a little bit different than the mm -hmm. Promethean would yeah. necessarily pr perform, but it gives him an opportunity. I think new theater itself, it, uh, with my predecessor, because I'm the second artistic director uh, out of 26 years. Um, we used to commission uh, uh, far more Nilo Cruz, we commissioned uh, Anna in the Tropics, uh, Beauty of the Father as well, um, Mary Diamond, several playwrights that are local. Um, and now this is my... And we've produced, now, we've pr now we're producing Mario's play. Correct. <laughs> now we're producing, producing Mario's play. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's awesome. Um, now I have my, my sixth year of, of being artistic director, I'm going back to try and uh, um, commission at least one local playwright a year. Uh, this year we chose one, and I think next year we've actually been speaking to Susie Westfall to uh, try to get that in the works. Because I think um, what, I've, what, what I've noticed locally is that we really need, and nationally actually, because New Theater's part of the National New Play Network, which is a consortium of, of about 28 to 30 theaters nationwide that champion the new work. And uh, what I've noticed is that I get every other theater giving me local playwrights from their town, but I don't really have a lot of playwrights locally that I can hand over and, and get their, their name out. And I think it's very important, my, myself being a playwright. So it's like I'm, I'm joining in with this force of trying to really uh, uh, house our local playwrights and make sure that their voices get, get uh, heard and Give produced. Them a platform. Exactly. Can you speak to audience? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, but like the idea of also creating for a specific audience. Um, I know we also we have a theater for young audiences. Um, are just a director on this panel, and just so how do you develop a relationship between playwrights writing and also since what Ricky and Deb are talking about are local playwrights, the relationship the playwrights you work with have with your audiences. Well, that's that's almost exactly what I was about to say. Okay. Is that um, when you commit to a specific playwright and you say, we're going to develop this playwright and work with them, whether you just do readings of their works and workshops on their works and then produce others of their works, it gets their name into the community and the community recognizes those names and they become familiar, maybe not to the extent that the actors might be, but that name becomes a draw too. And then they build a little support in this area and other theaters can say, oh, that theater trusts him, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a chance on it, which is what you were saying. Um, and, and especially if, if they are a local playwright, 
they get to know the community as well, and they can write to whichever audience, whichever theater they're working with, if they're working with many theaters in a certain community. Um, and and it's, it's fun to see when they trade back and forth. <laughs> I'm excited to see what, what, what Juan is going to do over at New Theater that's going to be different and conceptual and, and its own separate thing, because what they do is very different from what we do. Um, it's just as valid and just as important, but it is going to be a play that's suited to Ricky's audience and to the work that they do in the Gables, which is different than the work that we do up in, in, all the way over in Broward. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is important for artistic directors, as you touched on a little bit, is to commit to that second production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that becomes like yeah. the, the all-important linchpin. Um, so, in theater for young audiences, you know, we're a smaller field within this field, and so we keep in touch with each other all across the country pretty tightly. And so we can almost guarantee that there will be a second production, and sometimes the second production is in five cities at the same time, um, because we are, there's, usually there's a large theater for young audience, only one major one per city, if that, um, and then smaller ones, so we aren't really proprietary or kind of so we, we um, actually co-commission together. We group commission playwrights as well. Um, there's a show that I'm working on now that five of us are going in together because it's new economic times. What, what's the young audience? Young audience is, is <coughs> always changing. It's, um, I'm going to say zero, baby, and I'll explain that. <laughs> uh, zero years until uh, high school. Well, great. So, birth to high school. Um, so it's like the hearts of <laughs> yes, Seattle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And Make Linda. Sure audience is young. Yes, and Linda is one of our um, artistic directors, Seattle Children's Theater, that is ex bringing baby theater to America. Uh, <laughs> um, Denmark and Sweden are, are, of course, thousands of years ahead of us, and young audiences. And, uh, great high care. Developing. <laughs> plays for zero through four years old, and then that's zero to two and two to four, because in theater young audiences, um, we are a servant to two mistresses, the public audience and the field trip audience, mm -hmm. um, and the same show has to work for both. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the, middle, at the high school level, we start seeing less and less children coming in during the week, and I'll still call them children. Um, coming in during the week, and so lots of us are saying, okay, and then we see this new group, these mommy and me classes that happen everywhere. I mean, I had a daddy and me yoga baby class thing. <laughs> so you go anywhere with your babies, you know. So theaters are starting to develop programming specifically for this group, and they are the group that can come during the week as well. Um, so, that, so we're growing down instead of growing up, um, or actually at the same time. And so our season is very eclectic, so we have to look for things for the very young, and then at least something for the older, and then the broad range is that first through sixth grade um, age. And we, group commissioning is the big thing in our field currently. Although I have to dovetail off of, if you don't mind, and give a, uh, a, a shameless plug for Jeff and his theater, because uh, we City Theater are going to, for the first time, be bringing our show Camp Capuana up to Orlando Rep. Yay, this summer. Um, and so that spirit of generosity, um, I'm finding the theater for young audiences, is, is, is really wonderful, this, this whole um, consortium of theaters that, that Jeff works with, with. And so we're very proud to be um, joining up with, with Orlando Rep and answering, Andy, your question about how do you develop work for different audiences. Um, we've been producing summer shorts, which I think in terms of our audience would tend to be sort of PG-13 um, in terms of the content. Some, you know, we've gone into undershorts, but, but basically it was never really a family audience. Uh, and, and I say that as, you know, the parent of three little kids who'd actually never seen what their mom does every day. Uh, you can watch, but you have to get out real quick um, in between sh shorts. And so we, um, in, in working with new work and writers, went to a, a came up with an idea last year. It was our 15th anniversary of Summer Shorts. And um, somewhat, you know, I, I, I felt as if I wanted to, it would be nice to do something different that for 15 years actually my kids could see. Uh, and so um, 
went to a, a short play that we, a short musical we had done uh, with Lisa Loeb, uh, that was the best friend, and from that um, I had the idea to, to create Camp Capuana. Now in terms of working with a writer, we went to a writer who really doesn't write for young audiences. For any of you who know Marco Ramirez, or actually if, if you ever watched The Sons of Anarchy, you would say, wow, that's somebody I would never pay to write a play for young audiences. Um, and, and it was really, really interesting in deference to what you're saying about sort of cultivating your audience. Here we had this audience, the summer shorts audience, that was really, you know, frankly, rather sophisticated. If you look at the number of plays we do a year, and we went to a writer and we said we want, and we went to Lisa and said, um, you know, here's this this body of work, uh, music that we think would make a nice arc for a musical. We had a writer who had never written a play for young audiences before, and there, I think, in terms of commissioning and really being quite specific about what the expectation would be, um, we were really, really very specific because. In deference to um, you know what Jeff is saying, we knew that this was a musical we wanted to do over the summer, and we wanted to do this musical for kids that could actually get on a bus and go on a field trip. So automatically, that where, that winnows you down to kids that are about seven to twelve years old, seven to fourteen. Um, and those kids, if you really you know, kids is a very broad term. Just like if you say adult theater, that's a very broad term. Under shorts is very different from summer shorts is very, and I think we all could speak to that. Um, and so we really had to be very specific. Um, a lot of the music that Lisa had written on her original Camp Lisa album was really for littles. It was really um, skewed, and, and that's how Jeff and I discovered one another, was through our shared love of this, uh, this body of music. But a lot of the stuff was really, you know, peanut butter and jelly and, and stuff like that. And so going back to developing your audience, we had to be very, very clear about what the expectation was for the playwright, what the expectation was um, with the uh, composer and lyricist, and then also in terms of cultivating our audience. Um, we really, in a, in a wonderful way, I'm very proud, um, have developed a wonderful new audience of young people. And we've been doing this for, for 15 years going into the schools and with our shorts for kids. But all of a sudden, when we took the extra step and, and took a leap of faith of going to a full length, we discovered this completely new audience. And then we took the next leap of faith and um, we wanted, Camp Kappa wanted to get a second production and we decided that we were just the company to do the second production because it was a show that wasn't finished. And I will tell you, um, wearing the hat of a producer, that's not an easy sell because pretty much everybody will tell you no. Don't bring it back again for a second year. And we were told no by a lot of folks. Um, but we felt as if the play wasn't done. And so you really have to, you know, in deference to what you know, Deborah said, you, know, you, you want to be able to ha have a show and have a body of work that will hopefully go like wands to another theater and another theater and another theater. And so if you believe in a work strongly enough, you have to take the leap of faith. Um, and, and for those of you, I hope if you haven't seen this current production of Camp Capuana, I hope you will, um, because this is the second production. And it's a show that was at the Kravis Center and at Orlando, going to Orlando Rep, going to the Broward Center. Um, but the kids, we actually have added more performances to the show because we sold out our run uh, with our camp matinees. So as a playwright, I hope that will inspire you um, to be really specific in terms of if you see a, a, a void, a niche, that you can fill that and that you will believe in your work strongly enough to really push and make sure that your work is, is given the, the proper production. Let me say one thing quickly off of that. Um, I'm <coughs> Marco, who, who has written at least one other show for young audiences, um, Mermaids, Painted mm -hmm. Purple. Right, 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 right. right. Um, I'm glad what you mentioned that because to us, a playwright, and this is, our field is, has grown up a lot within 20 years. Um, we used to be what everyone calls children's theater, and I know you all have in your mind what that is. That's why we're not that anymore. Well, some people still are, and that's what gives us all a bad name. But we look for a playwright that's a playwright. It's not necessarily, a playwright isn't for children, or it, it's a playwright. It's just that the scope of the problems are maybe different. Nilo wrote the with enormous wings. With enormous wings right. um, for young audiences. So that's what we are all looking for in this field today, is playwrights. Right, I think it's, I, I, I know as a, as a playwright myself, it's, it's hard to, when you write a piece, it's hard to kind of say, this is what the piece is. It's really hard to get that object objectivity of your own work, and it'll work with this kind of market. And then trying to find a theater that will match, that will work hand in hand with that, with your vision, that's really, really actually probably the toughest job to, to actually get it in, to, or, or to, to figure out.
figure out. I know, I know the, um, there's this the, the, the drama the source book that actually helps you go through as a playwright and, and you can actually kind of, they do that for you uh, already and, and they put a lot of work into it. And that helps as well, kind of going and identifying what theater kind of matches your kind of work. Um, but it's really you, you as a playwright have got to do a lot of uh, footwork and really find out what the theater is all about. You know, find out what the artistic director's vision is. You know, and, and try to see if, if you're the if you're the match for that theater. And I, I, yeah, and I think it's also um, it's it's really up to the artistic directors to stop worrying so much about whether or not people are going to like it. Um, I think that there is so much pressure, especially in nonprofit theater. It's nonprofit. There is no money. You know, <laughs> it's called that at the beginning of the sentence. So we know this. So to be able to find someone who's willing to take the risk with you is the biggest. I find stumbling block for any any play and any new play at all. For me, I find it inordinately frustrating when I hear established theaters and established companies who are doing okay, no one's doing great, don't get me wrong, no one throw anything at me, I know the nature and condition of things, trust me. But to say, yeah, we just, I, I don't think our audience will go for it. How do you know? How do you know unless you jump off the cliff? And how do you know that that isn't the next Israel Horowitz, or it isn't the next, you know, big thing coming down the pike, a new voice that's, that hasn't been heard yet? You don't know. And you know what? Your audience may hate it, and that may be the best possible thing for your theater and for your development of, of that playwright's work, the development of your company and the development of your audience. But it scares the crap out of everyone. So you have to be able to find, and there are those of us out there who will do it because we feel that it is our responsibility. This is a dying art form otherwise because we cannot depend on every single play to be a home run, number one. Number two, it's important for us to be able to find the, the voices that are not being heard. And those voices have to be produced. And those voices have to be shown to everyone. And whether or not your audience all walks out and goes, oh my god, I can't believe I spent $40. Well, you know what? Great. I'm glad that you hated it because at least I got a response from you. And that's what theater is about. So you have to be able to take the risk and make the leap to do the work and to find someone who's willing to invest in you and in that risk taking. And that's the hardest thing in this whole bag because people are scared of closing shop. They're scared of losing their shirts. But that risk is also what makes this work and what we do so exciting. And then you find out that the world premiere actually is not the hardest one to get. It's, actually it's the, the second, second one. The third. And the third and the fourth. It's no. the life after the world premiere. That's usually um. the hardest because you, you know you get bad reviews and they knock you down. So how do you get a theater to believe in your work when you've already had bad reviews from the world premiere that you just had? Right. And it could be at the top theater. It could be at the lord, the top, the highest lord, and, and, you, and you just get a reviewer that just didn't like it. Crops on it, you know. And then how do you get how do you get to put it out there? It's it's quite difficult. Um, and, then the, and I think audience, audiences are still tr like American audiences. I must I think I have to say are still getting used to what uh, to trust in uh, new works, uh, world premieres. You know they're not perfect things. Uh, uh, I'm sure Tennessee Williams uh, uh, was not perfect when he first came out. Obviously I know he wasn't because he got closed many times and then he reopens in several other places. I mean it just it, playwrights is a process. Not, it's about process, it's not about product. And All right, I, as part of that process, yes. since we're talking a lot about relationship building, and how do, how do you start building those relationships? I mean, I know a lot of playwrights here are unproduced, or haven't been produced in a long time, don't really have a relationship. I, I mean, I know, for example, Juan works in your box office, Ricky. That's right. So I know how that, I know how that relationship got developed. Yeah. 
Well, but, no, it's actually before that. We went to yeah, school together. Uh, we right, have, we have sorry. Yeah, I, but that, that's a relationship that's there. But let's say, you know, Clarence out here don't have a relationship. How do they start building those relationships? Because I'd like the to talk, excuse me, I'd like to talk to something I think should be said to, to Florida-based playwrights. Um, I think it's in the workshop that I did today, I, I talked to some of you about going back to the place you were born in idiosyncratic language from the, the, from the place you grew up in as a really important re resource that you have that, that may be uh, indigenous language uh, or uh, even events from where you grew up is, is something that's really special uh, for you. Well, it, it turns out and I, and I said this because I, I do feel that if language is accurate, it brings a certain level of truth to a play, no matter what it's about. But for Florida-based playwrights, if you, if you uh, write about Florida, if you set your plays in Florida, it's, it's a really obvious uh, way to uh, attract uh, Florida-based theaters. Mm -hmm. And capturing, capturing the, the way that people live on your little dot on the planet Earth is incredibly important. And uh, it, 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 it's something you know well. I talked about forming support groups. Uh, if you're based down here and you create your own support group and you're writing new plays and people are writing uh, Florida-based plays, the, the Playwrights Lab, even at that level, every year, uh, when, the, when the plays were written, would do uh, a reading series which was, uh, in the spring we'd do a reading series which was really about criticizing first drafts of the play, but in the fall, the following autumn, we'd do a reading series uh, after the plays were rewritten during the summer that was really a market. And uh, when this reading series with 15 new plays and you invite a, a large group of artistic directors, they really do show up, uh, especially, you know, Five say yes, well the other 20 are afraid that those five will grab the best place. So they're, they're <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a really, really uh, good trick for getting your, your work seen. Uh, and it was really important for the Playwrights Lab. So, um, uh, you know, simply said, forming a, re if you're Florida based, if you're based here anyway, if you can form a support, showcase your work in a, in a reading series, the Florida theaters will come and pay attention to you. It's a hell of a lot better than putting your script in the mail or, or sending it over the internet. Uh, yeah. Show up. Young playwright to the play. Show up. Come see the play right. that's being done at the theater that is. Mm -hmm. Write the artistic director a note. Send them your play. If, if, go see the new play at the new theater. We're doing three new things at the Rent Theater this coming season, um, or that have some new aspect to them, come see them. We have two people who teach playwriting. I read whatever people send me, or at least I have somebody else read it. Three people read it, and then if three people tell me it's great, I'll read it. But, um, you know, show up. Show up, don't be shy. Introduce yourself. Sometimes the director or the producer are right there. They're usually so, there in Florida. I showed up here to see Barrow was introduced to a playwright. Two days later, I had three scripts from him. I've now read them, we're in conversation. Show up. Um, on that note, if we have time for like five minutes worth of questions from the audience, do a quick break and do Lisa Crone. I'm getting a look from Susan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say that four of you mentioned Juan's name, but for those not from the area, can you please say his full name? Juan C. Sanchez. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Back there? Yeah, thank you all. We appreciate it. Um, quick question. Up north, we had the Florida stage closing. Coconut Grove Playhouse is still in shambles. Um, the uh, uh, Gusman Center is still kind of up and down. Right now, there's nine of you up here. Five years from now, how do you predict the, the uh, environment for this type of event? And um, will there be 
12 of you or five of you? Five I believe there'll be like 20 of us yeah. and that we'll all have huge spaces and that we'll all have money and uh, you got to predict good stuff. We, you, you can't predict bad stuff. You just got to keep moving forward and keep moving. That's uh, what I think. And do what you can to survive. All right, we're going to go back and then to uh, Rachel and then we have to do a quick say thank you to our summer shorts playwrights, but just to let you know. So I know you're in Lisa Crown, but I'm blanking on your name. I'm sorry. Dylan. Dylan, what's your question? Um, in deciding new plays to do, do you think the chances are greater with a smaller cast or a larger cast, or does cast size really not matter? Um, I will tell you that I've gotten some really amazing plays with 14 people in them that I will never produce. Because On the other hand, there's August Osage County. Right, <laughs> and that's large regional theater, yes. and also uh, uh, university institutions that can support and afford those larger plays. Just, just have a look at it, theater that interests you. And, yes. see, they and see what they do. And and see, they yeah. Uh, if I could say just for what we do at City Theater, um, we may be unique in this. I know that the, the trend is two characters, three characters, but for us, we found it almost impossible to find large cast plays. Um, four, five characters. I don't mean 15, I mean five. And I think in the short play world, no one does one short play in a night. They're usually nights of short plays. So I think for in the short play world, I don't think you're running into the same problem of how are you going to get four actors that day or five actors that day. Uh, you know what I mean? Like those programs all have four, five, six actors doing the program that you can put in a piece. I would love. Anybody got any five character plays? Lay them down on my table because we Comedy. found none. Comedy. Yeah. yeah, that's a great calling card, especially as a young writer. Really, if you want to get yourself out there, you might some big short plays. Okay. Right. Can I just a ask the question of Henry? Because if you are writing a play with multiple characters, perhaps where you mean that play to go might be into a university setting Perfect. or a school setting. I mean, you've got kids that are that are obligated to put shows up, which doesn't mean that you don't have a limited budget as well. Oh yeah, uh, you do have a limited budget. But they're, they're usually <laughs> out. I've, I've seen Metamorphosis listed so many times, and it's often productions that are happening at universities around the country. I mean, how wonderful is that? That's a great teaching play, too. Right, and then Rachel? Uh, what would you recommend for people who are planning, or for young playwrights, I'm assuming some people in Lisa Crohn's group also want to move out of Florida. Would you recommend, you were mentioning support groups, would you recommend joining an existing one, looking for an existing one, or starting your own? An existing one. An existing one? An existing one. Well, a support group for playwrights. You find them everywhere. Well, you know, pick up a leaf. There's a support group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just you know, where, where, do, where do you want to go? Just about every city in this country uh, will, will have a, a, a writer support group. Just uh, where do you want to go? What interests you? Going to New York? Yes, or yeah, Boston. Easy, easy, yeah, easy, that's... easy to find. I mean, new drama just is the most wonderful. That should be a goal for all of you. Real support for the lark. The lark is yeah. probably not as good as the new dramatist. It's different from new dramatist, but there are, there are tons of, of support groups in New York, and, it, and it's really easy to start with. And that's that's one way. Again, the internet and social media work because through two AMT, um, you can find groups in cities all around the country and around the world that you know we we have we have groups in. Australia who play with us, and, and York, England, and uh, Toronto, and Vancouver, and all over Canada. Um, so the resources are there, and you can just say, hi, I'm a playwright, I've just moved to Fargo, North Dakota, where's the, where's the Fargo Playwrights? And someone will pop up and say, I'm, I'm here. All right. On that note, thank you all, thank this panel, and
Thank <laughs> you. 